Please open your Bibles this morning to the epistle of Jude. At Balfour, we affirm the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. A couple of weeks ago at lunch, the girls asked me, they said, Dad, where are you going to go preach to after you have finished Jude? And I looked at them and I said, well, girls, I feel that now that we have a good overview of the book of Jude, we can go ahead and really dive into it this next time around. So based on the expressions of some of you, it's just like our table. One was, oh, he's kidding. And then the other one, maybe he's not. So, but here we are, Jude 25, as we finish out this epistle. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts. In these things they corrupt themselves." Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that you would use your word to sanctify us. Lord, please sanctify us by your truth. 
Your word is truth. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes, Lord, that we may see and understand and obey the things you have written to us in your word. Lord, I thank you that you would call so weak a vessel to proclaim your word, Lord. And I ask you to please make your strength made perfect in my weakness, Lord. And I ask you for your sufficient grace. Lord, I pray that as we walk through the text this morning, that we would look unto Jesus. Lord, fix our eyes upon our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Verses 24 and 25 of Jude constitute what's called the doxology. Webster's defines it as, In Christian worship, a hymn in praise of the Almighty, a particular form of giving glory to God. So I've titled the message, Give Glory to God Who is Able. So keep the context of verse 24 in mind as we give glory to the God who is able. Back in verse 24, God is able to keep those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. He's able to keep them from stumbling. That is falling away into sin and... God is able to present those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. God is able to present them faultless, that is, without moral blemish, before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Our focus this morning will be verse 25, so let's look to the Bible with ears to hear and a heart to obey, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's begin by looking at the first part of verse 25. To God. We see the words there, to God. The Christian faith is anchored in the truth that there is one God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Christian faith is anchored in the truth that there is one God in three persons. The term we use to describe this is the Trinity. God has revealed himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see an example of this revelation when Jesus was baptized. The Bible says in Mark 1, 9 through 11, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In your bulletin notes, there is a symbol there of the Trinity. We also have it up on the screen. This is a helpful way for Christians to understand this concept of the Trinity. It is a biblical truth that the Christian believes in God the Father. The Father is God. The Father is not the Son or the Holy Spirit. Consider the instructions Jesus gives as he teaches us to pray in Matthew 6, 9. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The Christian believes in God the Son, Jesus The Son is God. The Son is not the Father or the Holy Spirit. Consider the testimony of the Apostle John as he identifies Jesus as the Word. The Bible says in John 1, 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. The Christian believes in God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. Consider the rebuke the Apostle Peter has for Ananias. The Bible says in Acts 5, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. I would encourage you, 
as you study your Bible, seek to understand and have a deeper understanding of the Trinity. As you do, keep in mind the question that Zophar posed to Job. The Bible says in Job 11:7, Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? Charles Spurgeon has a helpful illustration here. He tells the story of a preacher who had promised his congregation that if they came back the next Sunday, he would give a discourse, he would teach on the Trinity, and that he would make plain that mystery. So the preacher went to the seaside, and he began to, uh, to study, and he saw a boy coming back and forth between the sea and a hole that he had dug. And the man asked the boy, he said, what are you doing? The boy said, well, I intend to bring all of the sea and put it up in this hole that I have dug. The man said to the boy, why do you attempt the impossible and why do you misspend your time? The boy said to the man, well, that is what you are doing. I shall as soon bring all the sea into this hole as you bring all the knowledge of the Trinity into your head. It is important to know and believe and study the Trinity, but we would not want a God that we could completely understand and encapsulate all about him in our mind. So keep that in mind as we go into verse 25 now, to God our Savior. Now generally in the New Testament, the word God is used referring to the Father. Generally in the New Testament, the word Savior is referring to the Son, Jesus. Now that is not always the case. The Bible says in Luke 1, 46 and 47, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Webster's 1828 defines Savior as one who saves or preserves. The word translated Savior is used 24 times in the New Testament, each time as a title for God. Pointing us back now to the Trinity, one God, three persons. Consider that as we consider the Trinity and God our Savior, the Bible says in Titus 3, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So look to your Bible, verse 25. To God our Savior, who alone is wise. The Bible says in Psalm 147, 5, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. God our Savior, who alone is wise. He has wisdom and understanding far greater than the wisest among us. Jude will now identify God by four attributes. And as we walk through these attributes, think about how important it is for those who are called sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, to know God by these attributes as we contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So look to your Bible, verse 25. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory. So the first attribute we see here is glory. Webster's 1828 defines glory as brightness or splendor. When we think about the glory of God, it is the very character of God. In Exodus, God instructed the Israelites to build a tabernacle for him. The Lord said to the Israelites in Exodus 29, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Going on, the Bible says in Exodus 40, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. 
And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Then we get into the Old Testament and we come, or excuse me, the New Testament, and we come to the gospel according to John. Listen to how John describes Jesus. The Bible says in John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you look at that phrase, dwelt among us, it's literally translated tabernacled. So we see in the Old Testament, we see in the New Testament, the glory of God as He dwelled among His people. Now, the glory of God is present whether you acknowledge it or not. The Bible says in Psalm 19, 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. As Christians, we must remember that we were buried with Christ through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The Christian should aim to do all things to the glory of God, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory, walking worthy of God who calls us into His own kingdom and glory, believing that when Christ, who is our life, appears, then we also will appear with Him in glory. So as we think about the glory of God, as you spend time thinking about that through the week, the glory of God, Let it lead you to praise and worship Almighty God as you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Look to your Bible again, verse 25. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty. The second attribute is majesty. Webster's defines it as greatness of appearance, dignity, grandeur, Dignity of aspect or manner, the quality or state of a person or thing which inspires awe or reverence in the beholder. The word translated majesty here in our text, it comes from a root word meaning great. The word translated majesty here in our text is only used three times in the New Testament, here in Jude, and twice in Hebrews. In Hebrews, it's used as a name of God the Father. In Hebrews 1.3, when Jesus had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In Hebrews 8.1, Jesus, our high priest, is said to be seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now, the Bible says in Genesis 12.1-3, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God makes a covenant there with Abram. You see, it, you see it ratified in Genesis 15, but the author of Hebrews points us to the majesty of God, as the Bible says in Hebrews 6, 13, and 14. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. As you think about the majesty of God and recognize there is none greater. The majesty of God is present whether you acknowledge it or not. The Bible says in Psalm 93, 1, The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. Christians must remember to praise God for his mighty acts. Praise God according to his excellent greatness. As Christians have been forgiven of sin and healed from the death that was brought on by 
our sin. We should follow the example of the Samaritan man who was healed of leprosy, who when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God. The Christian should live with the perspective that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. The Christian should make it a priority to be looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as you read your Bible and you think about the majesty of God, let it be a means to lead you to praise and worship Almighty God as you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Look to the Bible, verse 25. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion. The third attribute here is dominion. Webster's 1828 defines dominion as sovereign or supreme authority, the power of governing and controlling. The very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the supreme authority. God is the one who governs and controls his creation. Job is identified as a man who was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Now, Satan attacks Job's character. Job loses his property and children and all this. Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Satan attacks Job's health. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, we know that Satan had requested to do these things, and we know that God had allowed these things to be done. Job and his three friends did not know this. So Job and his three friends seek to answer why these things happened to Job. A younger man joins later in their pursuit of answers. All the answers they can come up with are inadequate. In Job 38, the Lord answers Job. The Lord says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? As you read through, Chapters 38 and 39, you see question after question asked by Almighty God who has dominion over his creation, each one designed to bring Job into line, recognizing him as Almighty. Each question the Lord asks is designed to prove that the Lord is the supreme authority. Job is not. Now, God has dominion over his creation, whether you acknowledge it or not. The Bible says in Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Think about the children's song, He's got the whole world in his hands. Captures this principle perfectly. God is in control. So as the Christian faces tragedies and trials, we can do so knowing God has dominion over his creation. We can do so trusting that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now we know that our days are determined, the number of our months is with God. He has appointed our limits so that we cannot pass. As each one of us gets older and steps towards death door, a door that many are fearful to walk through, the Christian can walk toward death's door knowing that Jesus walked through it first. The Christian can walk toward death knowing that Christ is risen from the dead 
and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen, have fallen asleep. The Christian can live each day with the mindset, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So as you think about the dominion that God has over his creation, that he is the supreme authority, let that lead you to praise and worship Almighty God as you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Verse 25, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power. The fourth attribute is power. Webster's 1828 defines power as to strain or exert force. Dominion and power are so closely related. Vines writes that power denotes freedom of action, right to act, used of God. It is absolute unrestricted. So think for a moment. God is the supreme authority governing and controlling his creation. And we see here in the text that God has the unrestricted power to do so. Two weeks ago, we looked at the, closely at the power of God as he parted the Red Sea. The Israelites crossed over on dry ground. God then caused the water to return to its full depth, destroying Pharaoh and his army. The Bible says in Isaiah 51.10, Are you not the one who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep that made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? That is the power of the God we serve. So God is the supreme authority governing and controlling His creation. God has the unrestricted power to do so. God has jurisdictional authority over his entire creation. And that is true, whether you acknowledge it or not. The Bible says in Psalm 62, 11, God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. The Christian has the privilege to live their life in subjection to King Jesus, who said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The Christian has the privilege to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The Christian has the privilege to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So as you read your Bibles and you see example after example after example of the power of God, let those serve as opportunities to praise and worship Almighty God as you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Verse 25, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. The glory, the majesty, the dominion, the power of God does not increase, nor does it diminish over time. God is immutable. It means he is unchanging. The Bible says in Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. God is perfect. He doesn't have a need to get stronger, nor does he get weaker. The glory, majesty, dominion, and power of God is both now and forever. Verse 25, To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. The word amen means let it be so. To say amen is to acknowledge or affirm the truth of 
a statement. So if you're a Christian, you should affirm what is said in verse 25. The Christian should look at verse 25 and be able to say to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. We should affirm that very statement. For the Christian, how we live should show that we acknowledge the glory, majesty, dominion, and power of God. If you're not a Christian, when this wonderful hymn of praise here in verse 25 is directed to Almighty God, you have nothing to which to amen. Because you are actively in rebellion against God. If you're here today and you believe these glorious truths that the Scriptures teach, you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead and you would be saved. Instead, the unbeliever sits here this morning dead in trespasses and sin. And you sit here without excuse because the bible says in romans 1 20 through 21 for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power in godhead so that they are without excuse because although they knew god they did not glorify him as god nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, when you fail to acknowledge God in all His glory, majesty, dominion, and power, you'll think nothing of sin. Yet the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And only God has the power to forgive you of your sin. Your forgiveness rests in the decision you make about Jesus. The Bible says of Jesus in John 1, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, and the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So if you're here this morning, and you are dead in trespasses and sins, and the wrath of God is abiding upon you, I implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And this offer from God extends to each and every person The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's the invitation from the Lord Jesus to the lost and helpless sinner. And then Jesus said in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And no one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So Jesus extends the invitation to all, and he will not turn anyone away. So if you're here this morning and you're lost, come to Jesus in repentance and faith. God is able to save you. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, God will save you right now now if you're here this morning and you're saved come to jesus in gratitude and joy praise him that he has saved you from your sin give glory 
to God who is able. We'll take time now to pray, asking God to search our hearts and come to Him as He draws you to Himself. Almighty God, we praise You for Your glory, Your majesty, Your power, Your dominion. Lord, we thank You for who You are. We thank You for the gift of salvation that You have extended to all who would believe. Lord, I pray that as we're here today, I pray for Your children. Lord, I pray that we would not walk out of these doors carrying burdens that we're not strong enough to carry. Lord, but we would cast them upon You for You care for us. And Father, I pray for those here Lord, who have not been born again, I pray that they would not walk out of these doors in rebellion to you one more time, Lord, but they would come to you, Lord, who is the Savior of the world. I thank you, Lord, for your church. I thank you for your word. I pray you would continue to use it to strengthen, to build us up, and to revive us. In Jesus' name, amen.